Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, program number four, and uh, we'll be able to go home. For those of you joining us on television, again, we'd just like to invite you to what I think is a simple Bible study. We try to make the difficult things simple and uh, interesting. And again, we'd just like to thank you for your support, prayers, and your financial, and again, your mail. We read every letter. And uh, the other night, it took us till midnight almost, didn't it, honey? Boy, we had a bunch the other day. So anyway, we just want you to uh, search the scriptures, study them, and uh, be prepared to answer questions that are thrown your way, because after all, that's what we're here for. We're ambassadors. We are to share our position in Christ. All right, we're in book 77, and... uh, You multiply that times 12, and that's the number of programs that we've produced, and that makes a few. All right, we're going to go back and pick up the remnant of Israel that's going to flee to the mountains, as we saw Jesus warn them in Matthew 24 in our last program. And uh, it's going to be a, a mixed group of people, and I'm emphasizing that because a lot of people confuse this escaping remnant with 144,000, which is also a remnant. Well, hopefully in this half hour, we'll separate those two entities, that they are not the same. This remnant that Jesus talks about in 24 and what Revelation 11 and 12 are talking about are a cross-section of Israeli society. Because after all, The whole idea of this remnant is, is to be there and ready to go into the kingdom. And you want to remember that Israel is going to be the largest nation in the kingdom because of their largest number of entrants. And so here we're going to have, as we saw earlier this afternoon, one third of Israel's population, which would be around five million if it's in the near future. And that'll be far more than from any other single nation on earth, although there will be a scattering from every nation. But this remnant of Israel, which will be one-third of the total, or around five million, are going to be supernaturally protected by God out in some sort of a wilderness situation where all the horrors of the tribulation will not touch them. But I feel that they go out in unbelief, and then they will become a saved nation when they see Christ returning. And when they see him coming in all of his power and glory, every last Jew in this remnant will become a believer. And uh, we will hopefully have time to show that before the afternoon is over. All right, so if you'll come back in with me to Revelation again, chapter 11, we'll repeat. Verse 13, the last part of the verse, and the remnant were affrighted because of all that's happened as well as the earthquake. And the remnant were affrighted, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. And I feel that will be as they are supernaturally then escorted out of the city, never forgetting what Jesus said in Matthew 24, that you've got the... People living on the housetop, which I feel are the retired, the wealthy, who are pretty well set. Don't take anything on your house. Just get going. You've got the working class, and you've got the young mothers and the children and so forth. A complete cross-section in this remnant of the one-third that we saw back in Jeremiah and Zechariah. All right, now then, let's pick them up across the page in my Bible anyway. Revelation chapter 12. Verse 6. Now remember, the woman is now going to be considered the whole. Even as Paul spoke of the remnant in Romans chapter 11, and uh, they become then the whole, even though they are only a third. So the woman, this one-third, I feel, that are escaping from the area of Jerusalem, fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, A supernatural thing. And that they, the Godhead, should feed her there, out in this wilderness situation, for 1,203 score days. Three and a half years. So from the midpoint now to the end. Now, keep 
my beginnings and endings straight. The Antichrist opens the seven years back there in uh, Revelation 6, verse 1. Three and a half years took us to the midpoint when the two witnesses appeared, and the Antichrist went into the temple and defiled it. All in the end of the first three and a half years. All right, now at the beginning of this second half, we have this escaping remnant, and they are going to be protected for another 1260 years, which takes you to the end. And when they get to the end and Christ returns, then, of course, they'll be ready to go in and enjoy a refurbished, regenerated, reconstituted, those are all the words the Scripture uses, which prepares the earth then like a Garden of Eden for this thousand-year kingdom reign. All right, so God prepares a place, and they're going to be fed there for a thousand two hundred and sixty days, or three and a half years. All right, now the interesting part of their flight is to verse 13. Still in chapter 12, verse 13, And when the dragon, that's another name for Satan, and remember he is working hand in glove with the man Antichrist. <clears throat> so when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth out of heaven for the last time, he persecuted the woman, this remnant of Israel, which brought forth the man-child. Now verse 14, By God's intervention... To the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, the one spoken of in verse 6, where she is nourished for one year plus two years and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now, you've got to remember that this is all language of symbolism. And what we have to put to this is a reality. So, since Satan and the Antichrist are in control of everything, and they see this fleeing remnant of the Jews, what are they going to do? They're going to send out a command to some military to go and destroy these escaping Jews out there headed for the wilderness. All right, now uh, before I go back to Exodus, we're going to finish this account. So read on, if you will, verse 15. <clears throat> and the serpent, that is Satan, who is, like I said, using the man Antichrist, cast out of his mouth waters of flood. Well, that's just a military command to go and destroy these escaping Jews. Now verse 16. Supernaturally now, don't lose that. Supernaturally, the earth helped the woman, this escaping remnant. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood or that military contingent that the Antichrist has sent out after them. The earth opens up and swallows up this group of military which the dragon cast out or sent out by his command, and it just simply, utterly destroyed them. Now, what we have to do is go back to Exodus and understand that this is just a repeat of what has happened before. Exodus chapter 19. And this, of course, is after Israel has gone through the Red Sea and the Red Sea closed over the Egyptian military and destroyed every one of them without a loss of a single Jew. And so now they're safely encamped around Mount Sinai, and God goes up into the mountain to meet with God. Verse 3. <clears throat> and as you read, compare this constantly with Revelation. Revelation is just a repeat under little different circumstances, but on the whole, it's the same thing as you have here. Exodus 19, verse 3. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Now watch it. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. What did he do? He drowned them all in the Red Sea. And how I brought you, 
the Jews out of Egypt on what? Eagle's wings. Well, we got to stop now and be careful. They didn't fly, did they? No, they walked. But it was a supernatural exodus that got them ahead of the Egyptian armies far enough that they never touched even the rear echelons of the Jews. And it was a miraculous thing that brought them all the way out to Mount Sinai after the Red Sea experience. And so the scripture calls it as on eagle's wings. Well, it'll be the same thing for this escaping remnant at the middle of the tribulation. They're going to escape out of Jerusalem and Judea just like miraculous as they were coming out of Egypt. And so the language is the same. I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. All right, now then, if you'll come back to Revelation 12, just for a moment again, then we find that after they have brought to this place of safety, where Jesus said that they would be protected until the end of the tribulation. All right, now then, back in Revelation 12, where we just left off. Verse 17 after he sees the destruction of his military force and not the loss of a single Jew, he knows that he cannot do anything more with him because God is still greater than Satan. But now he turns his anger. Verse 17. And the dragon, Satan, was angry with the woman, that is, this nation as a whole, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. But now here's a different remnant than the one that he just missed. This is a remnant who has the commandments of God and keep or have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now what remnant is this? Well, this is the 144,000. See? This escaping remnant went out in unbelief. And they'll stay there in unbelief until they see Christ coming, and then they will believe to the last Jew. And I feel that's what Isaiah 66 means then when it says, will Israel be born in a day? Yes, when that whole five million to the last Jew will become believers and not a one will be lost. Now I told you I would show you where I get that and I imagine before I go to 144,000, let's do that a minute. Go back to John's Gospel, the last chapter, chapter 21, and drop in at verse 4. This is in that period of time between his resurrection and the ascension. And he has showed himself visibly, physically, over and over. Now the first thing I got to define is that the book of John has eight sign miracles. Eight. And they are sign miracles because of the Greek term semiion. Now, all the other miracles were not necessarily signs. All signs were miracles, but not all miracles were signs. Now, a sign for Israel was something that proved to them miraculously that God was in it. This wasn't a thing that would happen on the ordinary, everyday life. And it was a sign. So it was miraculous. All right, now in the book of John, we have eight of those miracles, and they were all signs. Now the first seven took place before his crucifixion. This one takes place after the crucifixion and resurrection. And now if you know numbers in Scripture, seven is the number of completion. Eight is the number of new beginning. All right, so here we have, I feel then, an indication of the new beginnings of the kingdom in which not a single Jew will be lost. All right, let's look at it. Verse 5 of John 21. 
Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any food or meat? Have you caught any fish? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. So they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, who I feel is John, said unto Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. Now he wasn't stark, but he was probably down to what we would call underclothes. And he cast himself into the sea, and the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were, two hundred cubits, dragging the net full of fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals, and fish laid thereon, and bread. And Jesus said, Bring of the fish that you have not caught. Now here's the key, verse 11. So Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 153. And I don't know, there's uh, some uh, more there than meets the eye. But here's what I want you to see. And for all there were so many, the net was not broken. Now you remember in other instances when they had a net full of fish, what happened? The net broke. But the miraculous part of this is, this net should have broken, but it didn't. And since it's the eighth sign, and we're now looking at the kingdom over the horizon, I feel that this is the sign to Israel that this remnant that's going to be spared in that last three and a half years, of that remnant, when they see the coming Christ, not a single one will fail to believe. And so the whole netful of Israelites will be brought into the kingdom experience. And so it's, uh, it's kind of an exciting thing to realize that all this miraculous thing that takes place, and yet you can reduce it to what we can understand and see will happen uh, day by day in Israel's experience. All right, now then, let's go back and look at the other remnant, the one that Satan is now going to concentrate on for these last three and a half years, or nearly so, because I feel that these men will be raptured up shortly before the end of the tribulation. Come with me to Revelation chapter 7. This is the other remnant. The first remnant was the cross-section of Israel. Men, women, boys, girls, wealthy people, common people, just a cross-section of society. This is a remnant of young Jewish men. 12,000 from each one of the 12 tribes. Revelation chapter 7 and drop down to verse 9. Now, of course, in verses 4 through 8, we have 12,000 from such and such a tribe, 12,000 from the other, and so forth. And we have 144,000. Verse 9, after this, after the sealing of these 144,000 young Jewish men, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. Now, watch where they're coming from of all nations, kindreds, and people, and languages, and they're standing before the throne because as fast as they become believers in this final three and a half years, they'll be martyred. They will not live to see the light of a second day. All right. So John already see the result of the ministry of these 144,000 Jews as they were able to circumvent the law. Now, again, it's miraculous. Do they have to go to language school? No. They'll know every tongue and tribe and language that they approach. Will they have to fight the airports? No. They're going to supernaturally go from place to place. And uh, won't anyone put them to death? No, because that's the purpose of their sealing. They may suffer privation, but no one will be able to put them to death until they have finished their ministry. All right, but as their converts who have become believers in this kingdom gospel, now remember that's not our gospel of grace. It's going to be the kingdom gospel. 
The king is coming, and that's what they're to believe. And so here they are, from every tongue and tribe and nation. And then we find, as you drop down to verse 13 and 14, <clears throat> and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these, or who are these, who are arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they who came out of great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he shall... Uh, dwell among them. All right, now that's the 144,000 that will minister to the nations of the world throughout most of the seven years. Now, I think they'll be raised up and uh, mar uh, raptured sometime before the final weeks. Come back with me now to Isaiah. Twenty-four. Thought for a minute I had the wrong one. Isaiah twenty-four. Now we're at the final end of the seven years. Everything has been destroyed. There's nothing left except a few survivors. I think I've got time. Let's read all the way from verse one. Isaiah, chapter 24, verse 1. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty. Now, this is as the result of the seven years of the horrors of the tribulation. I think the final month is going to be a nuclear holocaust like none of us can imagine. And it will make the earth waste and turn it upside down and scatter abroad the inhabitants thereof. It shall be as with the people, the priest, the servant, the master, right on down the line, the whole cross-section of society. Verse 3, the land shall be utterly emptied. There will be nothing left. You know, I always have to stop and ask people. Now, you know the kingdom, the thousand years, is going to be heaven on earth. Now, think about that. Heaven on this earth. Gambling casinos in heaven? Why, heavens, no. What's going to happen? Whew, they're going. And all the other garbage that's associated with the world society, would that fit in heaven? No. So common sense tells you God's going to have to cleanse the planet of all of it, see? Everything that man has contrived is going to have to go, and God's going to make it all new, see? And so that's why these languages are what they are. The, letter, the land shall be utterly emptied. Now, I envision it. Now, this is strictly my own idea. I can't prove this from Scripture. I can come close, but I can't really prove it. I see everything reduced to ashes like Hiroshima and Nagasaki were in 1945. Everything. And then God will miraculously bring it all back to the beauty of Mount St. Helens. Now, that's another one. I think God sent Mount St. Helens just to show us what he can do. How long did it take until Mount St. Helens was almost more beautiful than it was before? A year or two? Under ordinary circumstances. Look what God can do in the realm of the supernatural. So the planet will be regenerated, reconstituted. Now, these are scriptural words. In just a moment of time, but I think it's going to be totally reduced to ashes with all the nuclear bombs that are being storehoused today. All right, but whatever. Back to our text. Verse 5. The earth also defiled on the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, they've changed the ordinance, they've broken the everlasting covenant. In other words, they've flown in the face of God in everything they think, say, and do. Therefore, verse 6. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned. My, if that isn't nuclear language, I don't know what is. But, what are the last three or four words? A few men are left. Well, what is that? All around the planet, here and there, there are going to be survivors 
a few from every nation, I think, as we understand nations. Because by the time we get to the end of the millennium, after a thousand years, a tremendous population explosion, one nation? No, all the nations of the world are back in vogue. Well, where'd they come from? These survivors. These survivors. All right, but it stands to reason. Just like today, you've got some believers, you've got some unbelievers. Well, it's going to be the same way here. Not all these survivors are going to be believers, nor are they all unbelievers. So what do we have to do? We've got two minutes to show you. Come back again to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Verse 31. We're going to have to do this quickly. Matthew 25, and here come these survivors of Isaiah 24. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Now he's going to assume the throne there on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. He's finally going to be on his throne. <clears throat> Verse 32, now remember, supernaturally again, and before him shall be gathered all nations. Now when the scripture says all, it means all. So there'll be survivors from every one of the 140 some nations that are listed in the world today. All right, and he shall separate them as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He sets the sheep, the believers, on his right hand, the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, the believers of these survivors, Come ye, bless my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Where do they go? Into the kingdom. And I think back to their homeland. And so now the stage is set. You've got the remnant of Israel, the largest number, and then you've got scattered survivors of all the other nations of the world. And then at the beginning of that thousand years, there's no death, and it'll be a tremendous population explosion. And if I had time, I could take you back to Revelation. Nay, no, I can't do it. Only got second. But you get into Revelation, and when Satan is released, how many nations are represented? All of them. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.